During the Splatoon 3 Splatfest demo, I had a lot of fun and got really excited about the Vanilla Blaster. And I resolved that I was going to play it at launch and try to include it in my competitive weapon pool. When the game came out, I did tons of aim drills to make sure I was hitting my shots and played it even more than my splatter shot. It was one of the first weapons that I ever got the four stars. Results weren't great with the competitive team yet, but I figured that was more the result of the fact that I had thousands of hours in short range shooters and I just needed a little time to catch up on the blaster. Give it a month or two and I'll be there, I figured. In the meantime, I was encouraged by, I think it was Biscuit picking Blaster up and playing some games on it on stream. The VODs are down now, so I can't go back and confirm, but I know it was a member of Starburst's frontline. What I noticed, though, was that when I picked Blaster and Weapon Select, the conversation on the rest of my team got pretty involved. All of a sudden, there was a big gap in our team's ability to paint the map, so everyone was scrambling to flex onto their highest painting options. I started running into situations where I wanted to go Blaster, but I realized that a teammate would have done really well on a particular weapon, and that they weren't going to play it if I played Blaster. So now I had to weigh the value of my Blaster against the value of the weapon they would otherwise have chosen. More and more, I started playing shooters instead, because they fit into the comp easier, they forced fewer of my teammates to pick up Splash, and I only went Blaster on the specific maps that I liked. Big Bubbler also started falling out of favor around this time, as crab tanks were starting to take over and shredding bubbles in seconds with their insane DPS. Teams in general were also starting to learn that the counterplay was to shred the bubble quickly, and so it was starting to have less and less uptime. In time, I ended up only running Blaster on a few specific maps in tower control. The weapon was getting way less playtime than my shooters were, so I was getting less and less practice on it, especially in competitive play, and swapping between it and the shooters would often throw me off mechanically, since they play so differently. One day, I tried playing a shooter on a map I usually play Blaster on, and it worked just as well, if not better. My V-Blaster hasn't seen much use since that point. It's still sitting at 4 stars, while I've 5-starred both splatter shots in the 52 gals only 10,000 points away. This is the part of a tier list that casual players don't see. It's the part where, on earlier patches, we ran up against double machine, double splash comps, and scrim after scrim, and realized what we were doing wasn't good enough to beat what they were doing, and gradually running out of other options except to follow their lead. That may sound sad, and sometimes it is. I was excited about the blaster, after all. But ultimately, I was going to have the most fun playing the weapon that let me do my best, because I was a competitive player. It wasn't so much a failure as it was a hypothesis that was shown to be incorrect. It was just another step in the evolution of our understanding of a very complex game. That's not to say that our understanding of the metagame is always perfectly informed by all of the data. A lot of the time, top-level information about weapon matchups is difficult to collect, because you need to be in certain conversations and all sorts of different private Discord servers, knowing who the best players are on each weapon, and assembling all their various ideas into one coherent sense of how the game works. We only have so many content creators in the scene, and there are big gaps in any one person's understanding, no matter how skilled they are. There may just not be a lot of information on some of the weapons in the game. Metagames are necessarily reactive and iterative. They aren't about realizing some theoretically perfect idea from scratch. They're about beating whatever the other player does. So for example, I spotted a certain progression of how objective play works when making the How to Get Out of Ranked series. In C rank, some players just didn't understand the objectives very well. And one of the most important factors for whether someone succeeded in C rank was just whether they played the objective at all. But that sorted players so that when they got to B rank, people overfocused the objective to their detriment. Whole teams would jump on the tower all at the same time, and then three of them would get splatted by a single suction bomb thrown at the pole in the middle. Trying to play the objective was definitely closer to the winning strategy than not playing it, but that didn't mean there wasn't need of further refinement. The metagame also may develop into situations where progression isn't totally linear. Some strategies may work really well against one team, but really poorly against another team. There was a patch of Splatoon 2 where duelies were really strong in general, but they got countered by Brellas, so Brellas started seeing significant use. And then, since Blasters countered Brellas, they started seeing a lot of use. And duelies had a great matchup against Blasters. So it was like rock, paper, scissors. No one of those weapons by itself ended up being optimal. 
it was a combination of them that worked better. In the same way, a team's game plan may need to change depending on what they expect their opponents will run, and sometimes this can result in counterproductive arms races. FLC had an old lecture where he talked about the development of Splatoon 2, where more teams were running longer range backlines, and so then the E-Leader became meta, and then in response to that the Rapid Pro Kit with Splash Wall and Armor entered the meta, specifically as a response to just the E-Leader. He argued that the comps players were starting to build were beatable by just picking four T-Techs and running at the enemy team, something he called the Caveman Test, that people had gotten so laser-focused on that one metagame development that they weren't considering every available option anymore. They were like the cheetah, evolving for speeds no other animal can match, and in the process, sacrificing their ability to defend themselves in a fight and endangering their species. Kinda... Kinda similar to the sploosh matic actually. Anyway, while it can be difficult to predict which weapons really will be the strongest, over a good amount of time, with data at large tournaments attended by strong teams from diverse regions with different playstyles, we tend to arrive at about the best understanding of the game that we can. And sometimes the results you get back just don't speak highly of your weapon's ability to succeed in competitive environments. Sometimes players will start on a given weapon, but then as they improve, their opponents become strong enough to exploit weaknesses in the weapon that previous opponents hadn't and you start to feel your results lagging behind where you expect them to be. I've had a lot of questions from players, especially as I've just released a tier list, especially as the metagame is opening up and more playstyles are viable than before, about when it's a good time to seek out alternatives to your current choice of weapons. As has been alluded to already, the more data you can get, the better. Even if you have a pretty steady weapon pool and you're not looking for another weapon to play right now, it doesn't hurt to spend a small percentage of your time messing around with other weapon classes, developing a certain amount of mechanical skill on different specials, experimenting a little bit with the game overall. Maybe you run some for fun random weapon PBs with your team and end up finding something you're surprised you did so well on, and you bring that to the team next practice and ask if you can try it out for a few games and see if it works for you. Maybe you just play some casual anarchy battles on it to keep your chops on it. This is a dangerous recommendation, because a lot of players try to play way too many weapons at the expense of putting in the time to develop the weapons they actually need to master to rely on in a tournament setting, but it's definitely possible to overcommit to one particular weapon as well. If a meta shift leaves your single weapon behind, what do you have to switch to? It's a big risk for your team to take you on if there's only that exact one thing you can provide, and the opposing team decides to play its biggest counter, because they know you won't ever flex to anything else. Ideally, like I've talked about in my video on choosing a weapon pool, with a few exceptions that are worth one-tricking, you want a few weapons that are similar to each other that you can keep at a fairly high level of skill altogether. That way, much of what you learn on one weapon will carry over into the others you're working on, whether that be mechanical skills like splat dashing with two different short-ranged shooters, or tactical ideas like positioning with a charger or a long-ranged splatling. Ideally, even if one weapon falls out of favor or doesn't work as well on your team anymore, you'll have something similar you can spend more time playing. Lots of Splatoon 2 Splattershot Jr. players were able to transition pretty smoothly into playing splash o -Matic in Splatoon 2, because they started by maining Jr. with a Splash Secondary, and then when they found the Splash was working better, they just switched to that and never had much of a weapon crisis about it. But the point is that you need to have a running list of the top few weapons you're best at at a given point in time, and you should have at least a little diversity in that list to mitigate the risk of an unfriendly meta shift making your playstyle more difficult. Every time the game is patched or the metagame shifts, play some early solo games and scrims, testing weapons further down on that list than usual just in case you happen upon something you like. See how the new weapons introduced in patches change the metagame and interact with the choices you've made so far. And if anything is released that's similar to what you already play, pick it up for at least a short time to see if it's worth adding to your list. If there are common weapons players who run your class of weapons flex to, like for example backliners who picked up splash during crab meta, see if those fit well into your pool too. As long as you have even one other weapon in your weapon pool that you're comfortable playing in a tournament setting, the question of whether to drop a weapon or not becomes simple. Is the weapon you're playing going to get you better results than the available alternatives in the foreseeable future? You're never going to be able to answer that question for certain without a little bit of data. 
If you've only ever one-tricked a single weapon, yeah, you might have trouble deciding whether the discrepancy in experience between your main and the alternative is what's causing you problems. So there may be some moments where players decide they need to devote more time than usual to learning a new weapon to really know for sure whether it's worth it. But ultimately, if you're in a tournament right now, you don't have time to learn a whole new skill set. You may have to make do with the options that are going to be best for you right now. If those options have clear limitations though, and you feel like you're hitting a ceiling that you can't break through, it might be time to consider practicing some options after this tournament that aren't limited in that way. It's also important to consider your goals here. If you aren't going to enjoy the game unless you're playing one particular weapon, then you're not going to win more games by picking something else, because you'll stop playing the game altogether. If you're more interested in pushing one particular weapon than you are in winning, then push that particular weapon. There are reasonable ways to play this game besides trying to do the utmost you can to win tournaments. But for a competitive player, everyone ends up deciding they have to learn something new now and then. I'm still not great at Crab Tank, but I also recognize that it's too powerful to pass up, even with my half-baked execution on it. I never really got the hang of the Kensa 52 gal in Splatoon 2, but the practice ended up paying off when I finally got a feel for the Splatoon 3 52 gal that I rely on so often now. One other thing to think about is that a lot of the weapon choices don't have to be as binary as I always use it or I never use it. Maybe your preferred choice still works on some map modes and it's just a few others that are causing you problems and you pick up a secondary for those. Maybe on one team a weapon was working fine, but with a roster change it doesn't fit the comp anymore, so the issue isn't so much the weapon as its synergy with your teammates. I think so often players agonize over their weapon choices and worry about wasting their time on a weapon that they ultimately decide not to use. But I'd encourage them to think about realizing a weapon isn't working for them not as time wasted, but as a successful experiment. You found out that something else doesn't work, and now you can proceed confidently in the direction that's right for you without having to worry as much. You'll learn more by putting yourself out there and trying things than you ever will by not making a move until you know you're making exactly the right one. So just, dang it, turn into dating advice again. Now one reason a tier list can be useful is that not everyone has the capability to try weapons out at a high level of play. Some players just aren't at the point where they're going to get punished really hard for low tier weapon choices. So I find it valuable to communicate that, for instance, no one has found a way to make the Clash Neo work against Starburst. No human being has run that weapon against a top team and found success doing so. We've got you covered there. It's, it's probably worth barking up a different tree. If, for another example, someone's developing a really aggressive playstyle and wants to learn about which weapons fit that playstyle and have seen success in the hands of other aggressive players, a tier list makes it easy and intuitive for me to recommend that they try out the Tetradulis or the Vanilla Splatana Wiper or Tri Sloshers or Carbon Deco. Taken in combination with the opinions of a variety of players they trust, lists like that can help players find the weapon they're going to like and perform well with quicker, because they're not just getting data from their own experience, but from a summary of the available knowledge of the rest of the competitive scene. There's always room for skepticism. After all, you can go and compare my tier list to the one Chara made like a day before me on Twitter, and they're not going to look the same in every respect. Maybe he knows something about the Bamboozler or the Luna Neo that I don't, and you can see that there's disagreement there and seek out someone who knows more about those weapons to get their opinion instead. Maybe you think you've actually got a really solid counter to Splash, a weapon you think is even more versatile, and you decide to challenge strong players with it to prove us all wrong about it. But I share this information, as do others in the scene, because having a conversation lets us shore up holes in each other's experiences, and by putting more data out there for players to consider, allows people to come to a more complete understanding of the game than any of us can on our own. So if you're considering dropping a weapon, talk to people who play it better than you and see if they can provide solutions you hadn't thought about. Think about what your list of available alternatives looks like and make sure you're cultivating that list even before a crisis happens so you can be ready and it won't hit you as hard. If you think the alternative is going to work better, maybe for a few situations, maybe just all the time, then bring it up in conversation with your team, and if they agree too, start running it in scrims and start learning something new. You can always go back if it doesn't live up to your expectations, but you'll never know whether it'll live up to your expectations until you just mess around and find out.